our instructor will get your will get your attendance. Um, I really want to appreciate uh, to tell you that I appreciate everyone attending today. This is the first time that we have held this particular event. I know many of you have come to the Words That Change History Day that we normally hold in the fall, and this is a new uh, a new event for the QEP, the Quality Enhancement Plan. This is the Student Speaker Showcase, and uh, this event is um, we are honoring, I guess, and giving an opportunity to uh, four students today to give speeches that they have already given in a QEP enhanced class. In this case, they were all done in the fall. And they are going to be uh, giving those speeches again today. And we have chosen them, the selection committee, the QEP Student Events Committee has selected them as examples of good oral communication. And so um, that's what we're here for, to let them show, to showcase their uh, great speaking abilities. Um, I didn't introduce myself, I guess I should have done that first. Um, I am Gilchrist White and I am the QEP director. I'm also a professor of English, so you can find me up in the humanities uh, suite in this building. And um, I am, really pleased to bring to have you all today. Uh, there is still pizza and drinks. Um, I would appreciate you not getting up in the middle of a person's speech, uh, but you are welcome to get seconds as long as everybody has already gotten uh, a piece of pizza. And there are programs here if you're if you are interested. Uh, now without uh, further ado, uh, we are recording this process, and I think, Brad, you've already talked to our speakers. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce all four of our speakers, and then they will get up as they are listed on the program and give their, uh, and give their oral presentations. Uh, the first speaker that we have is Esther Akinwande, and she is going to be speaking on the pangolin, an endangered species. Next, we have Greta Silvertooth, uh, The Fight for Women's Rights. Samuel Akinwande, The Black Spider Monkey, Endangered Species. And finally, Quincy Reynolds, Pink and Blue, Gender and Sexuality in the US. So without ado, I will, Esther, if you will come forward. So my presentation will be on the pangolins. So what are endangered species? Endangered species are organisms that, if care is not taken, they will soon go extinct. And so we decided to talk on, I decided to talk on pangolins. Why did I choose pangolins? First, it was a group presentation. Also, it was a kind of thing that I didn't even know about. It's, there are pangolins in Nigeria, and I didn't even know about them. And so I decided to talk about pangolins. So I hope that through this presentation, you'll learn more about pangolins and just have a general idea about who they are and the advantages they have to us as a nation. So the classification of pangolins, as we can see, they are animals, and they belong to the order Folidata. Normally, when people say they're pangolins, they think they're ant eaters but actually they are more closely related to cats and dogs than to other, than to the ant eaters. So there are eight different species of pangolins. There are the African pangolins and there are Asian pangolins. To differentiate between <laughs> the African pangolins, you make use of the bristles. And so the Asian pangolins will have these tiny bristles protruding from their scales, and the African species don't have any of that. Also, they are covered in, in tough scales, and you know, the same thing our nails and toenails are made of keratin, which is a very hard um, material. And so they are covered in those scales. And they vary in size, you know, just like humans, they are, the big, they are small pangolins, they are really big ones. And then they, are, they have different colors. They are the light ones, they are dark ones, and they are, just, they are ones that are just in between. Also, you find them in different environments, in different habitats. You'll see some in the savanna grasslands, and you'll find others in flooded forests. So this video will illustrate some of the characteristics of pangolins. For one, pangolins don't have a good, good eyesight, so they use their nose to smell. And so you see them walking around with their nose smelling for food. 
And so you can see the way they are moving. They don't really move well, and their nose is really close to the earth. And so they just go around looking for food. One organelle or organ that the pangolins have that help them in their search for food is their claws. As you can see, they have really large and creepy claws. And so they use these claws to like dip, dig deep for food. Many times these ants are always underneath the, underneath the sand. And so you see them using their claws to dig deep. Another thing that they have that helps them get their food is their tongue. Pangolins have like a really long tongue. One pa the pangolin's tongue is, is longer than its whole body. It's about 40 centimeters. And so they use the tongue to like lap up the food. And you see they use the tongue. It goes into the nook and cranny of everywhere trying to get the food. So when the pangolin goes into the ants next like that, the ants do what they normally do. They try to attack by biting. But they have the keratin as their skill. And so the ants can't do anything to them. So you see them rushing in towards the um, scale, but they can't do anything for it. So another thing the ants do is they try to go towards its eyes and ears, but as you can see, it has special muscles that protect its eyes and ears from the harm. And so generally, the ants can't do anything to it. So interesting facts about pangolins, they are called scaly ant eaters. Like I said earlier, they are not related to ant eaters, but people just call them ant eaters because they look like ant eaters. Also, the word pangolin is derived from a Mali word, which is pangolin, and it means ruler. So you see that a pangolin has the ability to rule when it's on the, when it's on the earth. And so that's a pangolin rolled up. And when it's like that, a predator can't harm it. And so that is like a, that's like its defense. Also, they possess a muscular tail. And so you see that a young um, pangolin will climb on its mother or father's tail, and that's how they transport each other. So species and endangerment of pangolin. First, when you say an organism is critically endangered, it means it has an extremely high risk of extinction. When it is endangered, it has a very high risk of extinction. And when it is vulnerable, it, it has an high risk of extinction. And you see that the Asian species of pangolins are really endangered. They are critically endangered and endangered. And while the African species are vulnerable, so the, all of them are still endangered, but just in different Layers. So why are they endangered, you might ask? Some loss of habitats. And you see there's increase in population. People are trying to live where the pangolins would normally live. And so people cut off their natural habitat. And so they have to like keep moving from one place to another. Another thing is animal trafficking, which is very popular all over the world. Also medicinal purposes. Medicinal purposes is wrong because scientifically they don't have any, they can't function well. Actually, they use them to cure these diseases, things like demons, which isn't realistic. Also, human consumption. You can see a plate of soup, and the pangolin is like the meat, which is kind of perfect. Also, recent research on pangolins. So pangolins reportedly live for about 20 years. And pangolins are highly secretive animals. And so you don't really get, they haven't been able to do a lot of research on them. But one thing is sure, they are not reproducing as they ought to reproduce. And that is a kind of, that is a concern to the scientific community. So, and even when you take the pangolins from their natural habitats to the artificial habitats, most of them end up dying. Because, you know, just like humans, we need, we need to have our classes of food. We need the carbohydrates, proteins, and all. But when you take the pangolins away from their natural habitats, they don't get all these things. And so many of them end up having gastrointestinal diseases, pneumonia, and they end up dying. So even in artificial environments, they don't end up functioning as they ought to. So what's the survival plan for the pangolin? Sites represent the, con the conservation on international trade of endangered species. So this is like an organization that works on protecting endangered species. And so they've already placed a ban on all Asian species because, as we saw earlier, they are endangered. And so you can't, really, you can't traffic any Asian species of pangolin. Also, there are educational initiatives, just like the World Pangolin Day, which is the third Saturday in February. And so on that day, people just learn more about pangolins. Also, there are rehabilitation centers for injured or lost pangolins. There are wildlife authorities, how they're protecting the pangolins from harm. And lastly, if you are found with a pangolin illegally, you could be punished. And so those are things that have been done to protect the pangolin community. So in conclusion, 
I hope by this presentation, you've been able to learn more about pangolins, how they, how, they, how they help the society as a whole. And as a side note, one pangolin eats about 70 million hands in just one year. And so we can see that they also help in our, in our ecosystem in balancing everything. And so I hope that by this presentation, you've learned more about pangolins and just realized how cute they are in general. <laughs> Thank you. Greta Silvertooth, and today I will be speaking to you about the fight for women's rights in the 1960s, 70s, and into the early 80s. So in the mid to late 20th century, the movement known as second wave feminism began. The women of the 1960s and 70s were tired of not being able to do certain things, such as get a credit card, serve on a jury, go on the birth control pill, get an Ivy League education, or experience equality in the workplace. These women were tired of having to answer to everyone and never being able to be the boss. So um, women like uh, Gloria Steinem, Bella Abzug, and Betty Friedan brought the word feminism to the national con consciousness. In 1963, Betty Friedan published the book The Feminine Mystique. This exposed what it was really like to be a woman, a woman during this time period. And this ignited what would become known as the women's liberation movement. In 1966, Betty Friedan then formed the National Organization for Women, which is known as NOW. Uh, the purpose of this organization was to end all forms of discrimination against women. They used a lot of the same techniques that were used in the civil rights movement, um, but they also had some of their own. Uh, this one over here is the Freedom Trash Can. Uh, they, throw, they threw things like bras, girdles, aprons, dustpans, things that symbolized women's oppression into that trash can. Um, they also did something called the whistling on Wall Street, and women were tired of being sexually harassed uh, on, in the workplace and uh, on the streets. So they went down the street and made the comments that men made to them on a daily basis, and the men did not find that very amusing. <laughs> Um, in 1968, they protested outside the annual Miss America pageant, and the famous state statement, women use your brains, not your bodies, was made at this event. Um, then the Ladies' Home Journal, on March 18, 1970, the women of the liberation movement marched to the building where this magazine was published. Uh, this magazine was written only by men, and it gave women advice on how to make their husband happy. Uh, <laughs> Um, some of the things featured in this were tips on how to make a hamburger and what pies to serve at your next party. Uh, the women <laughs> marched to the office of the editor and sat there for 11 hours until the editor agreed to give them an entire issue to write whatever they wanted. So after this incident, uh, women were constantly, constantly being sneered by the media, so they decided to start their own magazine known as Miss Magazine, which is still in print today. Uh, the, it was first sampled in the New York Magazine in 1971, and 300,000 copies sold out in eight days. Wow. The first issue was actually in 1972, and it tackled issues such as abortion, domestic violence, and pay equity. This magazine became the major forum for feminist voices, and the co-founder, Gloria Steinem, was launched as the icon of the feminist movement. One of the best known victories of this movement was Roe v. Wade, which is the Supreme Court decision that grants a, a woman the right to an abortion. It was passed in 1973, and it gives women, the feminists believe that it gave a woman more control over her body, and they believed that it was not up to the government to, de to tell a woman what she should do with her body. Um, I looked up different signs of, uh, like, that they used to protest, and my favorite one was, my uterus is not state property, which I thought was comical. Um, and then uh, after this, they uh, fought for the Equal Rights Amendment. This amendment was only 24 words long, and it was first introduced to Congress in 1923. It had been reintroduced to Congress ever since, but barely reached uh, the floor for a vote. In 1972, this amendment uh, won overwhelming passage in both houses of Congress, and uh, they still needed the approval of all the states for this to become the 27th Amendment of the Constitution. Feminists from every walk of life mobilized to convince each state legislature to pass this amendment. And after 30 states ratified this amendment in, uh, in a year, the feminists were certain that the victory would be inevitable. However, the feminists were about to come upon 
uh, up against the most effective opponent of the feminist movement, which was Miss Phyllis Shafley. She was a conservative activist who organized a group called Stop ERA. Uh, most of her arguments were based on Christianity, and a lot of the feminists thought that she was a feminist herself, but she didn't want it for other people. She had a husband who would stay home with the kids while she went out and protested, so she was pretty much a hypocrite. Um, but she was very effective, and the momentum slowed behind this amendment, and it died in 1982. Uh, the ERA has still not been passed. So throughout the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s, many barriers were broken and many firsts were achieved. This changed the lives of women in the United States in a tremendous way. The women's rights movement showed the true strength that women have, that they are not weak and fragile like they were once portrayed. And this movement is ongoing, but thanks to women like Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem, women have some of the rights they are entitled to in the home and in the workplace. The Black Spider Monkey. I know, it sounds like a character from a Spider Man movie, or perhaps a weird fusion between Spider Man and a monkey, but it's not. In fact, most people don't even know this animal exists, and hence it has faded into mystery. My name is Samuel Akinwande, and while I was conducting intense research upon this animal, I stumbled upon a shocking truth. Black spider monkeys are going extinct, and we don't even know anything about it. Now, a large factor in its endangerment has to do with the fact that people don't know about it, so let's learn about this animal. Its scientific name is Atelis paniscus. It grows to be two feet long, but its tail can sometimes reach three feet, which makes the tail longer than the body, and I think that's pretty cool. That also makes it the largest monkey in South America. But enough science stuff. I mean, to truly understand this animal, let's learn about it in regular terms. It's called a spider monkey because of the way it moves. It grasps the tree with its prehensile tail and swings from limb to limb, giving the impression of a spider. This form of movement is known as brachiation. They have long black fur that covers most of their body. They have a red face and white hair on their muzzle. And I concluded that they look like a rather thin but fluffy teddy bear. But to truly understand the problems facing these animals, we have to understand their reproductive patterns. For black spider monkeys, reproduction is a triple threat. Yes, reproduction poses three major problems that prevent them from being successful in the wild. First off, black spider monkeys carry their babies for 7.5 months. I know what you're thinking. As an human being, 7.5 months isn't too much because human beings carry babies for nine months. But think about this. An average New World monkey only carries a baby for five months. For the black spider monkeys, those extra 2.5 months can be the line between life and death. Black spider monkeys also exhibit a late reproductive maturity. What does that mean? It means that it takes collectively too long to be able to start making babies. Here's a visual for you. Black spider monkeys only live to be 12 years old. They only start making babies at the age of six and can only have one baby every three to four years. If you do the math, that means that a lucky spider monkey can only have two babies over its lifespan. And that's too little, considering the rate at which their numbers are, are reducing in the wild. And that's not even the end of it. Black spider monkeys tend to depend on their parents for way too long, meaning that the parents have to protect the children, leaving the parents themselves open to attacks by predators in the forest. This might seem like rather random facts about black spider monkeys, but when you put them together, the reason for its endangerment started to come to light. When you include the fact that some human beings actually hunt these animals, it becomes a surprise as to why they aren't even extinct yet. To recap on the problems facing this animal, one, they get poached. Two, they're not very successful in terms of making babies. And three, they get hunted out by predators when trying to protect your babies. On top of it all, they can't live in disturbed habitats. What does that mean? It means that they can't live in places where animals have previously lived in. Here's a useful analogy to help you understand this problem. As a human being, imagine moving into a new house, right? You walk into the front door in the living room, the TV's on. 
the volume very, very high. You look on the floor right next to you, there's a rotten pizza. Walk into the kitchen, check the dishwasher, there's dirty dishes everywhere. Imagine how miserable that will make you feel. But guess what? That's what we are doing to those animals when we move them into a new habitat. But a skeptic might ask, well, what's my problem with that? I mean, it's just another monkey in the rainforest. Well, guess what? If you're concerned about the survival of the rainforest, this is your problem too. Due to their lifestyle, black spider monkeys cover large areas of land over their lifetime. And as they go around the forest, they hold seeds with them. They drop those seeds at specific locations, and those seeds germinate to make trees. And those trees are what make up the forest. So I concluded that they support the foundations of the forest. Except the only people actually doing anything about this are from the World Wildlife Fund. Their strategy is to preserve the habitats that we have. Note, I said preserve, not produce. They realize the futility in trying to make new habitats, so they simply attempt to, pro to protect what we currently have. But they can't work alone. They need your help. Your support and donations will go a long way in helping this company keep the animals safe. And I believe that together, we can move the web of obscurity or mystery covering the black spider monkeys. Thank you. Let me just adjust this for my short little hype. Now, who here has a favorite color or had a favorite color as a child? OK, those of you who don't have your hands up, you are lying to me, and I am offended. <laughs> now, we are able to say that we have a favorite color because human beings have one incredible ability. We can see millions of different colors. Now, this isn't as impressive as the mantis shrimp, who can see billions of different colors, but still pretty impressive. Despite all the colors we can see, however, we've decided to live our entire lives dictated by only two, pink and blue. Now, as Greta said in her presentation, there's a clear divide between men and women in the United States, and historic steps have been taken to overcome that. But I'm here today to tell you about how the world currently is and how we've become so comfortable with an issue that causes more problems than we even know. Like I said, we can see millions of different colors and we dictate our lives by pink and blue despite that. <clears throat> From the moment we are born, we are assaulted with pink and blue. From the blanket you were wrapped in as a child to the toy you were given at McDonald's. Everything, if you were a girl, is pink. Everything, if you were a boy, is blue. And at first, those colors don't seem so harmful. So everything you own is monochrome. That's not so bad, is it? But when we as a society begin to dictate who a person is or what they can achieve by the blanket they were wrapped in as a child, the true detrimental effects of pink and blue become more than apparent. Pardon me? Gender roles have influenced society since the dawn of time. Biological sex is definite. It's how you are born and the chromosomes you have. However, gender is a social construct. It was originally derived from biological sex. However, as cultures changed, this gen gender has become a distorted idea. This distortion creates what we see with pink and blue today, the foundation of American society that is cracked. The three greatest complications that this crack in our foundation causes are quite clear. The first being, gender roles create a dichotomous key that fails to fit all individuals. Second, gender roles create both de jour and de facto segregation. And, as with all kinds of segregation, gender roles limit progress and opportunities for all groups involved. The first issue with gender roles is that there are a multitude of people who fall not on either side of the spectrum, but somewhere in between. These purple individuals feel lost in a world so bisected by predetermined roles. Sue Palmer, the author of Toxic Childhood, elaborates by stating, the total obsession with pink stunts young girls' personalities. 
From a very early age, pink is shoved down their throats. We're creating this image of little fluffy pink princesses, a stereotype that some girls don't like, but forced to overwhelming peer pressure, have to conform. While it is important to realize that some girls and some boys do enjoy what can be a, a, defined as stereotypical gender roles, these stereotypes are so narrow that a majority of children are forced either to conform or to be subject to ridicule if they don't. And these roles can have an even more dangerous effect than childhood bullying because we teach our children not only to differentiate based on color, we teach them to value one color over the other. When I would give this presentation to a class, I began with having a group of volunteers draw marbles from a bag. Some marbles were pink, some marbles were blue, and the other half were a mix of the two colors, either a pink marble with small flecks of blue or a blue marble with small flecks of pink. Based on what marble my volunteers drew, I would make statements. If you drew a blue marble, I would say, oh, you are going to be our <clears throat> quarterback, aren't you? Bringing your team to state, you are our blue marble, right? Or if you drew a pink marble, I would say, oh, you're going to be the prom queen. You're going to win the pageant, aren't you? You beautiful pink marble, you're going to do it. But if you drew a mixed color, I would say something like this. Sweetie, I... I don't think you're going to be able to find a husband if you keep going around with all those little flecks of blue in your marble. If you drew a different color of mixed, I would say, oh, darling, do you have those flecks of pink in your blue marble because you didn't have a strong male figure in your life? I had my volunteers perform this activity to show them the harms of the current gender role system and to bring to light the topic at hand. But in my final presentation, this demonstration brought more to my eyes than I even knew my volunteers would realize. You see, because my last presentation, one of my final volunteers came up to draw his marble, but before he did so, he turned to his class and he made the statement, dear God, I better not get pink. He was 16 years old, and he was more afraid of being called girly than failing his psychology class. Pink and blue don't just tell our children what they should like or how they should act. They limit what we can achieve. We segregate based on gender every day and hardly ever see anything wrong with it. Teachers will split a class into girls versus boys and cite convenience as the reason. But this de jure segregation breaks into de facto when gender segregation, as with all kinds of segregation, creates not separate but equal students, but students given better opportunities and students given worse opportunities. Doctors Kerr and Moulton explained in their study the development of gender identity, gender roles, and gender relations in gifted students, the detriments of gender segregation by exploring how it affects gifted children. They found that men gifted in pink areas, such as arts, music, and dance, are hesitant to act on their natural gifts for a fear of appearing effeminate. And, <clears throat> they, and for women, the idea that STEM skills are blue is a barrier. Curran Moulton stated, despite decades of research showing no difference in sex ability, no sex difference in math ability, excuse me, the popular perception, <laughs> yeah, faux pas, <laughs> the popular perception is still biased against girls. Young girls gifted in science, te technology, engineering, or mathematics will continue from their young life on to believe that they are less, less able in this and less able to act. This study provided insight into how segregation is detrimental to both sides. Girls and boys gifted with blue or pink talents respectively are discouraged from those classes and directed towards courses where the child may not have the same skill or affinity. With the multitude of detrimental effects caused by pink and blue, there are even more complications that are aggravated by gender roles. As many of you may have noticed as you grow up, we are all expected to perform an acceptable amount of hyperfeminine or hypermasculine activities over the course of a lifetime and to participate 
to not participate or to participate in an activity deemed to be for the other gender opens you to ridicule. <clears throat> Doctors Wright and Bay explored this when they studied a traditionally hyper-blue activity, pornography. They found that men with a misogynistic mindset were, felt validated by the presentations of women in pornography. However, men with a more feministic approach felt uncomfortable with the medium. Despite this, both groups were more tolerant to violence against women after being exposed to pornography. This is illustrates the issue of stationary societal expectation, wherein detrimental social issues are allowed to exist and facilitate greater detriment. Wright and Bay, like Kerr and Moulton, concluded their study with the insistence that change in perception would be the only way society could progress. Pink and blue are as antiquated as the hunter-gatherer days, yet they still permeate our current society. Furthermore, deferring to pink and blue as the be-all, end-all of society limits our children's academic progress, our entire society's progress, and our individual benefit. We need to expand our gender role system to a purple approach that validates, <coughs> excuse me, validates the beneficial aspects of the respective genders while curtailing the detrimental hyperfemininity, hyperfemininity and hypermasculinity currently expected from both men and women. If we do this, we will allow each individual the opportunity to pursue their natural gift and in turn evolve society without limitations expressed upon ourselves. Because if there's one thing we really should have learned by now, it's that color should never dictate who we are or what we can achieve. Thank you for um, such interesting presentations. Uh, we really enjoyed it, and I hope you all have too. Um, there is a, will you put the link up? If, um, if you have a, um, a smartphone, you are, please, I'm encouraging you to get them out now. <laughs> uh, and there is a link um, there for our evaluation. If you would please fill that out, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, they're, of course, they're all anonymous. Um, and um, I don't know about the QR code. I don't know if it's, but anyway, but the, but the address is up there. Um, I have uh, some certificates of appreciation for our presenters. So as I call your name, if you guys would come up and um, maybe we can get a, um, some photogra a photograph of everybody. Okay, um, Esther? Thank you. Okay, Samuel? Quincy. And finally, Greta. Last but not least. <laughs> uh, I think there's pizza and cookies, and I think there's some drinks left. Please come help yourself. And uh, I think the presenters can stay for a few minutes for some questions. And thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all at the Words That Change History Day in the fall. Thank you.